Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Thank you. Thanks so much. And um, how's my voice? Can you hear me okay? Yeah, that's great. It's up there. Perfect. Well, uh, thank you so much. I, this is an, an unusual format for me to speak at, especially on the topic that I got to choose. But um, before I get started, I, I want to thank uh, the new people who are here. I, I, was, I have not been, I was trying to get to your group here. I, I got a list of the meetings uh, the last few weeks and the next few weeks, and I was hoping to get to experience the format, and I hadn't been. But I'm just so grateful that you have new people here. I, um, my, I'm, I'm, I'm Bob, and I'm an alcoholic, uh, and uh, I'm from Midwest United States, Iowa. I'm in Florida now. I'm in Florida half-time and, and in Iowa half-time, but in the Midwest, we have a, a tradition of how we introduce ourselves. Uh, we usually give our full name, but uh, then I would tell you that thanks to the grace of a loving God, both sides of sponsorship. And the book Alcoholics Anonymous, I've been sober since April 24th of 1988. And um, I'm grateful for that. Um, and people introduced themselves in the beginning of our meeting that way. And I, I was, in, in, you know, I was offended. I thought, who are these show offs uh, uh, talking about how great they are? And I was informed that that was the reason they introduced themselves that way <laughs> was just so they could um, uh, talk about. Of why they were sober to give credit where credit's due. And it is because of the grace of a loving God I found after I got to AA and both sides of sponsorship, which I'll talk about today, and um, maybe just as importantly, uh, the book Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, but welcome to the new people. Um, and thank you for inviting me. Um, so, in the idea of uh, talking about great events, uh, I've spent uh, probably the last couple of days, just thinking back to some of the great events that have come into my life, and I have no reason to understand why um, I didn't do anything before um, April of 1988 to deserve the good life I have today. But what I really want to tell you about is a miracle called Alcoholics Anonymous. And for the new people here, uh, I want to tell you that if you're like me, um, and, uh, alcohol and alcoholism has been around uh, as far back as recorded history. Uh, they say some three to 4,000 years people have suffered from what I suffer from. And it's only been in the last 87 years that it's helped to people like me. Uh, I'm going to talk about that great event, Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, because of that, it's just been around since 1935. I'd like to say to the newer people and, and admit to myself that uh, the timeline of history worked out for me. Um, my great-great-grandfather uh, died drunk on the streets of New York City, shot dead. His son, my great-grandfather, um, never found Alcoholics Anonymous. And, and the first one that had a shot was my father, really. And he came to AA and stayed a while and left and stayed a while and left. And, and so um, the good news is I... I, uh, I did not want to be like my father, but the bad news was I didn't think Alcoholics Anonymous worked a long time before I got here. But um, I suffer from something called alcoholism. I, I like your pre-readings that you did before to talk about alcoholism. Uh, it was described to me, and I agree that it's a, um, it's a disease that's progressive and fatal. It means it's always getting worse, and it'll kill you if you don't do something about it. And uh, since 1935, there's been a solution for that. And it's a spiritual awakening or a spiritual experience and a chance to pass it on to others. And I want to tell you that that is progressive, too. <laughs> I've, I'm, uh, if I could tell you anything and sum it all up, it would be that I owe my life to Alcoholics Anonymous. And because of that, I'm drinking from the saucer because my cup is overflowed. Um, Great events, uh, what I'm going to talk about today, really are possibilities. Some of the things I, I mentioned to you that have happened for me since I got sober. Um, uh, AA doesn't promise me anything, but it does make everything possible. My sobriety does. Uh, 
The very first event I want to talk about is the great event of Alcoholics Anonymous itself. I got sober in 1988, and in the, the late 1990s, uh, some of you might be old enough to remember, we were coming up upon a, a millennium. We were going to be changing into the 21st century. And something happened during the last two years, 1998 to 2000. And if anybody's old enough to remember Time Magazine, it was a great, one of the most well-read magazines in the country. And they looked at it as an opportunity to celebrate um, their 80 years of being in publication. They started in 1920. And so they hired some of the greatest historians, researchers, and they asked them to go back to the year 1900 and come up all the way to the year 1998 or 2000 and find the 80 greatest events of the 20th century. And after about a year and a half, they brought it back to the committee and they put it in a book. And in that book were things like um, you know, the space shot, the man landed on the moon, um, uh, some of the in incredible diseases, the, the vaccine, Jonas Salk invented the vaccine for polio. Uh, the Berlin Wall came down, 9-11 happened. Uh, all of these things were listed as the 80 most greatest events of uh, the 20th century. And they ended up putting them in a book uh, called 80 Days That Changed the World. And uh, like I said, you and I, the timeline of history worked out for us because if you look in uh, 13 uh, pages, they listed, AA takes its first steps. And so for anybody that's new, like I said, the timeline of history worked out for us. Um, we're living at a time when uh, one of the greatest things that happened in the 20th century was Alcoholics Anonymous. And um, I have a, a couple guys I sponsor and we regularly remind each other um, uh, that uh, what are we doing with this great gift that's been given to us? Am I treating AA today like one of the 80, 80 greatest events of the 20th century? God, I hope so. Um, the reason I have a tie on today, I'd wear a coat on most days, um, would be um, my sponsor and my grand sponsor always taught me uh, to treat AA with respect and dignity. And uh, that's why I wear a tie here today. That's why um, uh, one of this group's traditions is not to use, um, um, I'm going to say, colorful language. They ask you not to swear, so I don't swear at meetings. Um, that's why I'm, uh, I, when I go to meetings, my sponsor taught me how to behave at AA meetings and, and to uh, get my seat early, shake a few hands, and uh, introduce myself to possibly new people. And um, yeah, to our new people, I'm so glad you're here today. So Alcoholics Anonymous, one of the greatest events of the 20th century. Now, I, I mentioned my father's drinking, and, and so I'm going to talk just a little bit about um, my drinking, enough to tell you that um, um, I have alcoholism. And, and uh, because of my father's drinking, when I was growing up, um, my friends, by the time I was 12 or 13 years old, were experimenting with alcohol and, and a few other substances. And, and it was so easy for me to say no to them because I was never going to be like my father. And that worked for a long time. And I fast forward, I'm 14, 15 years old. And we had one guy's house we met at all the time. And uh, when I would go over there, I would see the effect produced by alcohol. These guys like me, 14, 15 years old, would get just enough alcohol and they start doing goofy things. And uh, one, I, I had a motorcycle when I was 14. I've had three motorcycles. I never had a motorcycle license. That'll tell you a little bit about me, but I had a motorcycle then that I would ride over there, and um, I was talking to my friends, and all of a sudden, I heard this motorcycle start up, and I was not around it, and I walked to the backyard, and a guy came across the backyard on my motorcycle, going fast, flew through some hedges out into a busy street. Wherever you're at, imagine a busy street where cars are passing day and night. And I thought to myself, that, that's what alcohol does for them. That's another reason I'm not going to drink, right? Well, that works good until one morning I woke up and I, I you could call it uh, puberty. Uh, you could call it um, adolescence. Nobody gets around it. Um, 
I just woke up one morning and I was kind of on myself. I mean, the freckles I had looked as big as quarters. And uh, I started to notice myself and I wondered what other people thought about me. It's all I could think about all the time. And the other thing I noticed was girls. Now, I grew up with four sisters and I couldn't stand any of them. They picked on me. But uh, I did start to notice some of these girls. And I particularly had my eye on one gal. And uh, she and I walked to school the same way. She lived about two blocks from me. And uh, within about two months of school that year, I, I knew what way she walked to school. I knew which way she walked home. Uh, I knew where her locker was. I knew where her classes were. And I had never talked to her. Uh, today, they'd call me a stalker. Um, but I was extremely interested in her. And, and we had, uh, at those days, a football game. And before the football game, they'd have what's called a mixer. And that's where you would dance together to a band um, after the game. And, and I told my buddies, I said, this Friday night, I'm going to go dance with Roseanne <laughs> at that mixer. And I'd never danced before. And I, I felt confident on Monday when I talked about that. Along about Wednesday, <laughs> I got this knot in my stomach. And I started to think about what it would look like, and, and it didn't get better. And Friday night, I showed up at my buddy's house, and they were getting ready to walk to the football game. And uh, one of the guys said, you look terrible. <laughs> he says, are you sick? And I suppose I was white as a sheep. And, uh, and he said, you just need to have a couple of drinks. I said, look, I told you guys, I'm not going to be like my father. I hate beer. And they said, well, yeah, we got something different than that. And they went inside and brought out a green tumbler about that big, and he says, this is slow gin. It's mixed with 7-Up. It tastes good, and it'll take the edge off of what you're feeling. I wondered, how did he know what I was feeling? <laughs> I suppose because of the way I look. And so I took about half of that glass down, and I did like the taste, and nothing really happened. I pulled the other half down, and like a lot of my friends would say, the magic happened. Something happened to me there and then. You might even call it a great event. Um, the reason I say that, to find that feeling and that relief, a lot of people like me, when they're going through that time of their life, by this time, my dad's long gone. Our family's living on a, on a shoestring. Uh, we can hardly afford meals sometimes. But I found relief from care, boredom, and worry. And I said, get me another glass of that, and we'll go to the football game. Well, they got me another glass, and we headed for the game. And and about two blocks later, I found out what I called it slow gin. And my legs quit working. And um, I would end up having my first drunk that evening, passed out, blacked out. And uh, I lost a couple of times. I lost a leather coat. My mother had worked two jobs to buy me. I uh, woke up the next morning very, very sick in a twin bed. And uh, boy, by the time I shook it off, I thought of a lot of different things. Didn't remember much of the night before but what I really remembered was what happened to me at the end of the first glass of uh, slow gin and 7-Up. Now, you don't, you don't get, I don't, and didn't go living on the streets right away or anything else. But what I had, like a lot of people do at the beginning, was some fun. Alcohol was a lot of fun, it seemed like. We might drive our car up in the mayor's front yard. We might just have a hell of a lot of fun. And it's a progressive illness, though. For anybody that's new, it's progressive. It means it never gets better. It always gets worse. And I didn't know anything about an allergy I had or an obsession I had to, to get that feeling. I would just drink every time we could. And by the time I'm in my early 20s, that fun turned into fun with problems. I'm 22 years old. My wife, I'm, I'm married. And by then, she's pregnant with our first child. And along about eight months of the pregnancy, and my wife complained of illness that morning. By the afternoon, she said, I called the hospital. They said, we ought to come down. We got to the hospital. And my wife had something where the amniotic fluid um, was not right. Um, and so they said, we're going to keep her overnight for observation. Now, looks like a lot of good men on this meeting. And I suppose uh, good men would have done what I should have done that night. You would have said to the person in the hospital, hey, could I get a bed to sleep by my wife here? I'm scared to death for her. I want to make sure everything's going to be okay. And the thought came to me that I could make a few phone calls on the way home, and I'd have a host of buddies, and we could get together and talk, and I could take away this pressure I had about being a father. I didn't know how to be, and a husband I wasn't, and um, I left. And uh, I got home. There were already five cars in the driveway, and we started getting it going. 
And by about 10:30, 11 o'clock, I had a good one tied on and the telephone rang. Somebody upstairs rang, answered it, one of the guys, and said, it's the hospital. They want to talk to you. The baby was on the way. Well, um, you can't drink enough black coffee and throw enough cold water on your face to get sober. Somebody drove me to the hospital. They told me which room she was in, and I made my way down the hallway. I don't know if any of you have watched the movie about Bill Wilson. Uh, my name is Bill W. Uh, God, when I saw that movie the first time, um, when his wife was in the hospital and lost the baby, I, I'm telling you, it was a flashback for me. Because I'm disheveled, I got my clothes half put on, and, and I'm looking for the room. And finally, I find the room that my wife was in. She's in hard labor. And uh, for any of you that have never been around hard labor, it's not a pretty sight. And the whole gravity of the whole situation hit me. And as I was told, I took one step forward, one step backward, and passed out. Next thing I remembered was her father, who was not a fan of mine, waking me up in some room they'd put me in to tell me that I had a beautiful baby daughter named Allison. And... Uh, yeah, it's tough to get over stuff like that. Problem with alcohol is you can't stay drunk all the time. And that would be one of the first things I would just totally regret and hate it about myself. And um, so the second stage for guys like me is fun with problems. Alcoholism is a progressive illness, though. And um, I've got a job, the wife's staying at home, the child. We had two more children. And uh, the anxiety, the the, the Adverse reaction to life on life's terms continues to come toward me, and I'm drinking more frequently. Oh, by the way, I, I took a job with the Anheuser-Busch distributor like my dad used to do, and drinking was pretty common there. And uh, I started to experience one of the late stages of alcoholism, which is it's all problems. And uh, in my late 20s into my early 30s, um, like I say, can't stay drunk all the time. Some of the things that happened in our home uh, were despicable. Some of them I didn't remember. My children were scared to death of me. I was loud, angry, sometimes physical with them. And I um, was scared to death of me, just like my thought. It seemed like there for a long time, I would, uh, I would, you know, sometimes uh, somewhere one of my bars pass out on Friday or Saturday night. Somebody would bring me home, prop me up against the front door. I'd make my way into the house. And the next morning, it seemed like for a long time, I could kind of come to shake it off just a little bit and understand the gravity of the situation and say, by God, that's enough of this stuff. I'm just going to turn over a new leaf. Uh, today is going to be different. I'm going to take the family out for lunch and play ball with the kids. And boy, I just feel better just thinking about it sometimes. But I'll tell you that last year of drinking, I would try that same game and wake up and say, yeah, uh, today it's going to be different. I'm going to turn over a new leaf. And the next voice that would come into my mind is, no, you aren't. It hasn't been different for a long time. Buckle up. This is the way it's going to be. And I realized, and I conceded to my innermost self, that I was always going to need alcohol the rest of my life. I just couldn't imagine living without it. That began the rounds to psychiatrists and marriage counselors and um, uh all, all of the, um, I don't know what you'd call it, uh, humiliation of getting sober, making promises, breaking them. And uh, the one I remember probably the most is that beautiful young daughter of mine. The, uh, by now, she's 10 years old. And uh, I would come home, you know, uh, drunk, and, and the kids would be crying as I argued with their mother in the living room. The next morning, I'd wake up and promise to put a new thing. By the next night, it was happening again. And one night I came home in the tank, just sober enough to remember what I was doing. I went into her bedroom and I shook her and woke her up. I said, Allie, it's Papa. I love you, honey. And by that time, imagine this 10-year-old daughter scared to death. She would look up at me with just disdain in her eyes. She didn't say she hated me. Couldn't say she loved me. It was just that blank stare of a child who was living in alcoholism. I can still remember that like it was yesterday when I wash over me. Um, that's not enough to keep a guy like me sober. I've got alcoholism. And uh, my wife did uh, told me that she was going to do some type of a court committal and all of this. And I said, no, no, no. And so they did something called an assessment. 
at the hospital and asked me about my drinking and I lied my way through it. And, um, but I quit drinking for the first time ever. And I had never quit drinking since I found it. And uh, after about six or seven days now, I didn't go bowling. I bowled three nights a week. I sold beer at the bowling alley. Mm -hmm. And uh, I didn't go bowling three nights. And uh, six, seven days later, I am a week sober. And I got to think to myself, wow, I am so glad this is my time. I thought it would be harder than this. Eight, nine, ten days sober. I started to think, God, Bob, isn't it great? You don't have to live like that anymore. On day 11 and 12, the thought started to come to me. Wow, as, as easy as that was, you, you owe yourself a couple drinks. And the next night was a Thursday night. And I uh, headed out to the bowling alley, put a $100 bill in my pocket, and I called my wife on Sunday. Uh, uh, that drunk lasted three nights, three days. And when I called my wife, she told me that uh, my clothes were starting to kill the grass. I should come home. And I went home and um, packed my car and drove over and broke into my dad's mobile home. Woke up sober the next day. And uh, I always like to say, I am sure that somewhere the AA helicopter was circling around that time and looking at me, watching everything happen and say, oh, we're going to get another one. We'll get him. And he will never drink again. <laughs> and the fact is, they ended up getting me shortly thereafter, and I've been sober since. Now, that's not the end of the story. <laughs> but uh, what happened is that my family did a, here's a great event. I don't know. Now, fast forward to today. You know how hard it is, how hard it is, hard it is to commit people today? You can't get people committed today. My family got court committal papers, and they were able to commit me. Uh, and I attended something called an intervention. I didn't know that's what I was going to be attending. And I, I will tell you a couple things about that. Uh, an intervention is not a fair fight. Uh, and uh, something else I would suggest to you, if you go to an intervention and you haven't been at the pre-planning meeting, the intervention's on you. And everybody knew their parts. I tell you this looking backwards. They all knew what to say, when to say it. And pretty soon the last person was my mom who was physically sober, and they showed me the court committal papers. Off the treatment I go, and I'm four days sober, and I went through a 35-day treatment program. Really grateful in some ways, but I came out of there, and they told me to attend three AA meetings to introduce myself to people, and I did that for the next seven weeks. And uh, I would tell you what I experienced those next seven weeks is what we call meeting-based sobriety. Attend the meeting over here, attend the meeting over here, attend the meeting over here. And uh, I was as physically sober as I am right now, 11 weeks sober. And I uh, had had all of AA I could enjoy. And I could hear my friends at my bar, Scotts and Soda, almost calling me. Come on back, Bob, we miss you. And the obsession was on me. So I decided I would go to my last AA meeting. And this is when a miracle happened. And a great event to me is like a miracle. And a miracle is when something happens and nothing's ever the same again. Happened to me when I took my first drink. And something amazing was going to happen to me. I went to this meeting. I'd never been there before. I came in a little bit late. And I sat down at a table. And uh, by the time I scoped the place out because I wanted to know where the door was, um, I uh, heard a guy talk at that meeting. And I looked two tables over and... Uh, sitting at that table talking something about his dad and having a relationship with his dad was the guy that rode the motorcycle through the hedges when we were 16 years old. And I heard everything he said. I thought, my God, that's Mike. That's Mike. I couldn't believe it. And in today's NAA lingo, I would tell you, he was my ebony. He was fresh skin and glowing. I was flabbergasted. He was the guy we said, if we ever get as bad as him, we will quit drinking. And here he was, sober. It ended up being just eight years sober in Alcoholics Anonymous. So my Ebby is, for me, 20 feet away. I'm like, most people would grab him and say, please tell me what to do. But I got the obsession to drink. And we did the Lord's Prayer. I dropped hands, and I do what I do. I headed for the door. And this is where Alcoholics Anonymous took place. And uh, Mike didn't talk to his buddies about the football game coming up that weekend. He wasn't talking to him about a problem he was having at work. 
he circled around and he had spotted me. And he came right in front of me and says, Bob, Bob, is that you? And so I acted surprised. Oh my, yeah, I, I, I didn't realize that was you. He said, oh yeah, he says, I haven't seen you around AA. I said, God, I love AA. What do you mean? He's talking a little AA to him. And uh, I said, I'm, I'm letting go and letting God. I'm working some stairs. I love AA. And um, Mike, was a, Mike was a good Alcoholics Anonymous member. I think he knew he had somebody in a lucid interval. And he, he just cut right to the chase. He said, well, that's great. How about if I pick you up tomorrow and I'll take you to a meeting? He says, we'll meet some people and I'll get to introduce you to some people maybe you haven't met. He, he put the clothes right on me. I didn't know you could say no. This is my first time in AA. I didn't think you could say no. So I said yes to him. By the time I left, I'm walking out to my car and thought, well, why, why would you pick me up? I got two cars in the driveway. Do you know why you would pick me up? Guys like me don't go to the meeting. The next day we have a change of heart, so to speak. And he picked me up, began to take me to meetings and fast forward. I had a, I had a different experience at Alcoholics Anonymous. Any of you that are new, uh, give another member a chance to take you to Alcoholics Anonymous. That's what I have as a different experience. And one of my friends would say it was preparation. Mike was armed with the facts about himself. Meeting opportunity, an old high school buddy. And God does the handshake. And uh, I just had a totally different experience. Everybody knew him. He introduced me to people. It was uh, a great event unfolding for me. And about a week later, I said to him, I said, hey, so I, and they're talking about this sponsor thing. I don't think I have a sponsor yet. Do you sponsor people? And he laughed. He said, well, I've been kind of doing that already. Of course, he said, come on over to my house tomorrow. And I'll tell you how I sponsor people. And uh, I was going to be introduced to another great event. Got over to his house and he cut to the chase. He said, God, Bob, he said, I'm so glad you made it to AA. He said, what I'm going to help you do, what I help the guys I sponsor, I help them do Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> I wonder what he was talking about. I said, my God. I wanted to say, we've been going to meetings every day, for God's sake. What do you mean, do Alcoholics Anonymous? And here's what he told me. For any of you that are new, who have been attending meetings, and you're not feeling better after a month, two months, just attending meetings. He said, oh, Bob, he says, AA is not something you attend. He said, AA is something you do. And he handed this book to me. It was my first big book. And he says, what we're going to do, he says, I want you to come over to my house starting Monday night. And we're going to three times a week, I want you to come over. We're going to start at the beginning of this book and read from the beginning all the way through it. And every time it says to do something, we're going to do it. He says, it takes about six months. He says, during that time, now here, here's the brilliance of Mike. I'm already uh, two months sober. Things aren't great at home yet, but I'm feeling the guilt, shame, and remorse. He said, during that time, I don't want you to start taking dance lessons with your wife. I don't want you to become the softball coach of your kids' softball team. He's only going to make Alcoholics Anonymous the most important thing in your life. And it takes about six to nine months. The other thing we're going to do, I want you to go to regular meetings regularly. Now, I thought he was stuttering. But what he meant, he says, we're going to go to the same meetings all the time. That way, you don't know, have to wonder where you're going on Wednesday night. You don't have to wonder where you're going on Friday night. People are going to get to know you. You're going to get to know people. Wasn't he right? He said, I want you to get a home group. And he told me what a home group was. For now, you can choose mine. And uh, I did that. He says, we're going to go to two step study meetings a week and two speaker meetings a week. He said, uh, as we work through these steps, I expect you to have something called a spiritual awakening. He said, it'll take a little while, but it works every time, Bob. It happened for me uh, eight years ago. He said, I expect it to happen for you. And uh, he was absolutely right. Now, what I didn't know, uh, many of you are familiar with Dr. Bob's, one of the greatest talks in Alcoholics Anonymous, his last talk. Some of us call it the Gettysburg Address of Alcoholics Anonymous. One of the things he said in there was, uh, where would any of us be if somebody hadn't given us a pat on the back and take us to a few meetings? He said, what we want to practice is love and service. Now, I was experiencing, and I didn't know this till later, a chain reaction of love and service. Because in 1943, there was a guy named Don F. 
who had been arrested 43 times by the district attorney in Des Moines, Iowa. His name was Ray H. And Don F. got a hold of a book called Alcoholics Anonymous in Omaha, and they 12 stepped in, and he stayed sober. He went over to see his friend, Ray, the district attorney, and said, Hey, Ray, I think you could use this too. <laughs> and Ray stayed up all night reading our book. And those two together started the first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous in 1943. Ray caught fire, and in 1950, he carried that message to a guy named Shaq W. In 1960, Shaq carried it to a guy named Lauren W. In 1980, Lauren carried it to Mike. And in 1988, Mike was armed with the facts and carried that message to me. It's been happening for a long time. This is AA, he said. And we began on the steps. He sold me on step one. He talked about step two, and we just kept going. We did a third step prayer on our knees. And uh, this is not a step talk. I would just tell you I've been through all the steps. Mike did not waste time. He said, hey, there's a retreat coming up. I've sent in your money. We're going to do your fifth step up there. He didn't ever say, do you have this weekend open? Uh, do you think you could take time off work? He just said, this is what we're doing next. And for anybody that's new, I want to encourage you. If you've been trying to stay sober like I did on meeting-based sobriety, it has a time exploration. And uh, our 12 steps are, are made to produce something in me called a spiritual awakening, where I don't succumb to the desire to drink again. I had a, a great event happen for me right after my third step prayer. I was sober by that time, about four months. And I went to a clubhouse I've been to many times. And there was a gal there, and she spoke at that meeting. And I listened intently at meetings. I was starting to have the feeling. And uh, she said uh, that she was four months sober and had been thinking about drinking. And you know what the thought came to me? I don't remember the last time I thought about drinking. I was four months sober and actively sponsored, going to regular meetings regularly. I had a home group. Mike was making me the assistant chair. I was chairing meetings with him. And I was doing Alcoholics Anonymous, not attending. And uh, we went on through and did the rest of the steps. And uh, he was right. Our first nine steps are meant to have a guy like me have what's called a heart opening experience. It opened my heart is what it did. Step 10 is a blueprint for how to go forward from there. Step 11 is going to help me grow in what they say. And step 10, understanding and effectiveness. And uh, step 12, is to help me do what Mike taught me to do. And uh, Mike immediately got me into service. I didn't know that was important. That was the other arm that was, mi was missing sometimes for people, kind of our third legacy uh, service. And he got me busy uh, uh, being co-chair of the group. Before long, I was um, uh, we were going to the prison. I'd never been in a prison. I said to Mike, Mike, I've never been in a prison. He said, I know, Bob. You know how to stay out of them. They don't. <laughs> we're going to carry the message. And so we went, uh, there was a prison 40 miles away, and every Sunday night for a year, we took a meeting after that prison. And uh, he taught me about commitment, to make commitments and keep them. Uh, he was the all, he was the GSR, and I was the alternate, and he became the district committee member. You know what that meant? I became the GSR. I was what they'd call a pain in the ass GSR. Um, I learned so much information. I was on fire for Alcoholics Anonymous. I'd come back at the beginning of the meeting. They'd say, does the GSR have a report? <laughs> and I'd take a deep breath. And about 10 minutes later, they were scowling at me. I was just so excited for Alcoholics Anonymous. But I, I was going to the district meetings and, and really on fire for a day. And Mike taught me to serve. Anybody else that's uh, six months or nine months or you've been going through the steps, I want to encourage you that uh, something Mike told me, he says, if you want to increase your chances to stay in Alcoholics Anonymous, get a commitment and learn to serve. He always said that service is the dividing line of the two great groups of the world. Those who help, those who hinder. Those who lift and those who lean. Those who contribute and those who only consume. I'm a taker by nature. But something, uh, something else was about to happen to me. Uh, I, I would call it another great event because I'm, I'm now this time um, probably close to a year sober 
And, you know, we're going uh, to treatment commitments and all of that kind of thing. And you know what I realized? And this is when you kind of come out of a self-centered, it's all about me. I started to realize, my God, this guy, Mike, every time I call him, he answers the phone. And I talk to him every day, by the way. Uh, that got to be where I, I didn't even mind leaving a, a message on his phone answering machine. Loved to hear his voice. Fell in love with that guy. He taught me how to be a father. Um, I would go over to Mike's house and there'd be flowers on the table. And I'd say, oh, Mike, are you in trouble with Annie? And he'd say, oh, no. He said, I, I just wanted to let her know how much I love you. <laughs> I don't understand that concept. He was teaching me to be a husband. And then I would he'd teach me to be a father. We'd be in the basement reading the book, and his beautiful daughter, Kelly, would come down the stairs. He would stop reading right in the middle of it. And he would say, hi, Kelly, what can I do for you? Said, what about me? I thought, you know, and he would pay attention to his beautiful daughter. I just didn't have that yet. Mike had what I wanted. And uh, I want to tell you, um, I've, I've had material awakenings in my life. And uh, Mike was my spiritual awakening. I wanted to be like Mike. I always made about four times as much money as Mike did. He was a janitor. But he had a better standard of living than I did. Anybody that are new, get to know your sponsor a little bit. What I like about the people that are doing the three legacies of Alcoholics Anonymous is that they're living the good purpose outside of AA. And uh, Mike was doing that. So I asked Mike, I called him, I said, God, man, I, I hate to tell you this. I, I'm just so aware of how good you are to me. You're such a good friend. I want to tell you how much I appreciate it. What could I ever do to repay you? And you know what he said? He said, help somebody else. Now, by this time, I'm armed with the facts. And I had, uh, I'll had i tell you, God can use our character defects. Um, one of my friends used to say that I'm, a, I'm kind of a Bill Wilson guy, and Bill Wilson would admit some of his defects, and I still had them. It's, it's tough being a big shot in AA. I would tell everybody that would listen, yeah, I'm a GSR chair in my home group. I, I, just, I was so full of myself. But um, there was a little clubhouse we had, and it was a place where mostly indigents came. <laughs> but they said they were looking for a new member of the board of directors, and you had to be a year sober. I was a week away from it. And Mike was with me, and I said, Mike, do you think I could do that? Well, let's ask him. It doesn't start for a month. You'll be a year sober by then. So they said, yeah, yeah, you're going to be a year sober. And I thought, my God, finally I've arrived. I'm on the board of directors. <laughs> but let me tell you about clubhouses. Uh, what it is, is you have a business meeting once a month and everybody argues. Uh, what we did was um, uh, spent most of our time uh, talking about how much we were spending for toilet paper. It wasn't a very, it wasn't a very big deal. But this is still how sick I was. Um, I, the, where I worked, we had a, shared a secretary. Now, back in those days, for you new people, I'm going to talk some old language. We carried pagers with us. And uh, we didn't have phones, we had a pager. And they could cage you and talk to you on this little thing on your hip. <laughs> so I, I'm full of myself. And I'm going to one of the big noon meetings. And I, 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 this is what I staged. I said to my secretaries, would you do me a favor? Give me a call about noon. Would you remind me? I've got a board of directors meeting tonight. And that meeting starts at 1130. And so, boy, I just couldn't hardly wait. I'm watching people's faces. And, and all of a sudden, the beeper goes, Beep, 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 beep. Said, Bob, just a reminder, you have a board of directors meeting tonight. <laughs> I was just proud as a peacock. I, I was looking for the bases to, you know, light up and say, there he goes again. Is there no end to Bob's goodness? And uh, people were just looking at me like, turn that damn thing off. <laughs> but that's, that's the guy I was at that time. And something was about to happen. Being on the board there, he had keys. And they had a time lock that would lock after everybody left. And the lock wasn't working one night. So I went down about halfway through the meeting that was about to end. And I was impatient. I wasn't glad to be there. And uh, uh, some guy near the end of the meeting raised his hand and said, hey, I need to ride, ride back to the YMCA. And nobody raised their hand. Nobody raised their hand. And I thought, well, this now this is how bad. I thought this would look awful good. At least there's a lot of people here. I'd say, well, I'll take you back. I'd be glad to give you a ride back to the Y. No problem. And I, I did not do it out of valor. Uh, I did it to look good. And uh, something was about to happen to me. A miracle happened, a great event. 
Um, when we got in the car, um, I turned the music off, like my sponsor had said. And he said, you get a guy, Bob, he says, you know, don't tell him about your crazy, you know, uh, wife or tell him about the hard job you work at or whatever else. He says, tell him the hard medical facts. Tell him how hard you, you know, it was for you to stay sober. And so I started talking about the, how hard it was for me to stay sober before I got to AA, how I'd make promises and not keep them, how some reason I'd get started drinking and I couldn't stop. And, and there was no, no sound, and I thought he was sleeping. And we come to a stoplight, and I looked over, and his eyes were as big as saucers. He told me on the way back to the YMCA, he says, nobody has ever told me that before. And uh, he said, um, do you sponsor people? I said, yeah. I says, I'll pick you up tomorrow. We'll come to a meeting here, and I'll tell you how I sponsor people. My first sponsee was a guy named Don. He's a street person. He'd been he was drunk on the streets in Phoenix, and he would run into bars and grab bottles off the back bar. And, and he looked disheveled. A lot of us do by the time we get to our late stages. Don and I went through all the steps. And um, I just want to tell you about uh, a couple of the things, the great events I've had sponsoring people. I, I've always enjoyed sponsoring people because you get to watch the magic happen. And uh, Don, like me, went to regular meetings regularly, worked all 12 steps out of our book, began to help other people. And uh, he became one of the nicest guys to be around. Turned out he actually was a Mensa. He had an IQ that was off the charts. He went to work for one of our local colleges. Uh, he was one of the top 10 accordion players in the world at one time great musician. And uh, I got to watch him just expand his consciousness that way. Uh, fast forward, uh, 2001, we had what was uh, you know, the great 9-11 um, uh, in, in the United States. And uh, that next uh, January, several of us went skiing in, in uh, Utah, in Salt Lake City, which where they were having the Olympics. And there was nobody skiing then. I mean, the, the people were barely on planes again. Don was on that ski trip with us. And we toured Salt Lake City a little bit before we went uh, into ski at the uh, mountains. And uh, he'd made a couple phone calls, and we went into the place where the Mormon Tabernacle Choir sings. And they invited Don to sit down and play the organ at the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. And he played some things, some music that came out of there from this guy that was at the YMCA. And uh, something shook loose in there. I want to tell you about another guy. And this is, I uh, was probably, I just, I like to always go, we have a beginner's meeting at my home group before the meeting. And I like one of the other meetings I went to, a step study, had a step one, two, three meeting where the new people were going. I love to go in there. I just love the chance that I'll catch somebody in a lucid interval like Mike did me. And uh, went in this uh, particular meeting, and uh, there was a guy with a gal sitting on his lap. <laughs> Love AA, don't you? Uh, they, they turned out they were both very sick. But uh, she told him that he had to have a sponsor before the meeting was over. <laughs> and uh, preparation met opportunity. And the guy's name was John Kay. I'll keep his last name uh, private. And he was hungry. I got to tell you, um, he was spiritually hungry. And I told him everything Mike told me. He was just in town for three months. We went through the book, and he was on fire for Alcoholics Anonymous. He lived about two hours away as where his family was, and he moved back there. It's a town called Burlington town of about 50,000. AA, in all purposes, honestly, was almost dead there. One of those communities had been overrun by meth and nobody was going to AA. But the people that were, they had nobody to lead them there. John K. changed it all. He became Johnny K. of AA. <laughs> Down there, people just clamored to him. And uh, he would call me and always ask, well, what do I do now? What do I do now? What do I do now? Um, I saw a man come alive. Uh, I saw him uh, start dating a woman when he was four years sober. And for two years, they dated. 
and I want to say they dated and did nothing else. He came to me and told me, he says, I want to do it right, Bob. He says, we're not going to uh, enter the bedroom until after we get married. And he did. He got to keep his own vow there. I was best man in his wedding. Oftentimes when I wear a tie at a meeting, I'll wear the beautiful pink tie I was wearing at John's meeting or John's wedding. And um, uh, he just was the bright, bright, shining star of AA. And everywhere he went, he would just, he lit up and could, he couldn't say enough about AA. And um, three years ago, he got cancer. John did. He was 12 years sober. And uh, I watched him gracefully uh, succumb to cancer. And um, as we, uh, my sweetheart and I were down with him and his wife, he would be sitting up in the bed there in the house talking about how grateful he was for AA. And uh, got to spend a lot of time with him at the end. And, and um, about a week later, they had his funeral. And I want to tell you, uh, back when John um, first came to AA, he could have held his funeral in a phone booth. He wasn't welcome at home. His parents wouldn't take his calls anymore. He was a burden to society. And because of Alcoholics Anonymous, there was the biggest church in Burlington that was full to the brim. People coming outside, guys who sponsor that I got to who come up and introduce themselves to me. That is Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, I want to um, tell you a little bit about heartache and joy. Uh, one of them is um, my marriage. Uh, I put everything into Alcoholics Anonymous, but I was not able to carry it into my marriage very well. And um, at about a year and a half sober, um, uh, my wife wanted to divorce me. I don't blame her. I mean, I was Mr. AA. I was a big shot in AA, but I wouldn't take the garbage out at home. And um, so um, I showed her. I moved out. And I, I moved, got a house. My sponsor said, get a place where your kids can come. Well, I was broke as a joke. And I got a house that was almost condemned. But uh, my sponsor, who had never been divorced, taught me how to be a good father. He said, uh, you're going to have your kids on Tuesdays and every other weekend. So he said, I want you to show up on time or early. I want you to take them back on time. If she needs extra time on the weekends, I want you to give them to her. If she wants you to take them on Wednesday and Thursday, I want you to go get them. And uh, it was the first time I really got to develop a relationship with my daughter. I don't mind telling you that unfortunately. Um, but um, uh, we divorced and for the next two years, um, I was a, you know, a divorced father who did AA, did his job and, and tried to have my kids come over. For the first six months, one of my daughters, the one who had the eyes dead in her head when I was when she was a kid, she wouldn't even come and see me. She hated me. And uh, over time, I did what I was supposed to do. Uh, one of my friends says, calls it the do say ratio. How's your do and say ratio? Are you saying something and doing something else? And uh, I did what I said. I brought security. My sponsor said you're bringing security into their lives. And uh, at about six months, she asked if she could come one weekend. And uh, she began to come regularly. And um, when uh, I was about four and a half years sober, uh, she asked if she could come and live with me. And um, because um, we had to, and her mom didn't want her to, we had to do a little court battle. And um, uh, I, uh, um, I remember going into court, and I want to share this with you, a great gift because of Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, went into the court, and she, my wife had hired a Cracker Jack attorney, and she was just beating me down with the questions. It says here, you did this, and you did that. And she's got the liturgy of what I used to be like out there. And I said, and the judge said, uh, is that true, Mr. Mr. Bob? And I said, yes, it is. And finished up. And the judge said, uh, Bob, I, you, you told me that you weren't drinking anymore. I said, yes, sir. He says, are you doing anything about it? going to Alcoholics Anonymous? He said, he said, do you have a sponsor? Do you sponsor other than a judge asked me this? I said, yes, sir, I do. He says, how long has it been since you had a drink? And I said, four years, sir. And uh, they met in closed quarters um, after that. And the judge came out and told me uh, that I would be uh, awarded my daughter. And um, I drove, uh, my daughter was in high school then, and, and uh, she was waiting for me to come and tell her. And this is a long time ago now, but I remember it like it was yesterday. I 
drove up in front of the high school and she came out the front and saw my gun. And uh, she ran down the high school and I did thumbs up. And uh, unbelievable what would happen then. I ended up raising all my children and they're getting to do all the things I never did right. Uh, I'm a great grandfather of their children. And um, uh, six weeks ago, my first great granddaughter was born, Mabel Jo. And Mabel Jo will know my name. And uh, she and I will do things together because of alcoholics and others. So many, many great events have come to pass. And uh, I'm glad to get to share a few of them with you, not near as many as I'd like to. Uh, my phone number is in the chat for anybody that got it. If you'd like to call and ask any questions, you can. And for now, I'll close. And, and thank you very much for letting me be here today and share with you. Thanks again. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.